angels, the, the, a multitude of angels appears. And in verses 13 and 14, we read this. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Peace. So the coming of the Messiah, the coming of that baby in the manger, was to mark a time of peace, the advent, if you will, of peace. Well, how's that been working for 2,000 years? <laughs> so far, we really haven't had a lot of peace. So what, have, what is meant by this? Or, is, or is it, were the angels just completely wrong? Well, the first thing we need to realize is that peace is not found in circumstances. And honestly, that's the way most people approach it. Most people think, well, if I could get the kids to quiet down and everybody does things my way and I get my way and everything, I'll have peace. No, you won't. There'll be, there'll be something that will not be right in your, in your life. If we look back at the, that first Christmas, Mary and Joseph, did they have a peaceful first Christmas? Think about it. Um, in verses 1 through 7, we have the description of Jesus' birth. And in the first four verses, we're told, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Gazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Now, a lot of times we read that and we just kind of skip over it. We kind of skim it. We think that's not an important part of the story. But I want you to think about it this morning. If you got a letter from the IRS that said you had to go to your ancestral home, making that journey walking most of the way, and when you got there, your reward for going back to your ancestral home was they were going to uh, get, make you pay taxes at that point. They were going to uh, exact taxes from you at that point. I think most of us would be a little grumpy at that kind of an order. You know, I, I was born and, and grew up in Chicago. That's Chicago's a long ways away. And I could probably count on it being kind of busy when I got there, too, if everybody who's ever from Chicago and re returned to the city, boy, I, that, that'd be a mess. And then to have the audacity to say, we're just doing this so we can collect money from you, and we're going to demand more money. Now, Mary and Joseph had, did not have a good experience. And in addition to that, verse 5 goes on and says, He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. So, Mary not only has to go to David's ancestral home walking, she has to do it pregnant. Now, I have agreed for the benefit of my marriage to never comment on pregnancy or, or any kind of attitudes or anything like that. But uh, I can just imagine that this would not have been a pleasant thing for Mary to have to walk a uh, hundred some miles uh, pregnant, nine months pregnant. This would not have been a peaceful scenario. And when they get there, verses 6 and 7 says uh, that they placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available to them. There was no room. And so they get there, there are no accommodations. Now, my wife and I do like to travel, and she assumes that when we take off from where we are, I have a reservation at our destination. And uh, there have only been a couple of times that we've gotten to the destination and said, mm, we're not too uh, sure of this place, let's look for something else. But uh, Mary and Joseph had no reservation. And when they got there, there was no accommodation. There were no rooms for them. And uh, in addition to that, they were forced to stay in a stable with animals. Uh, I can't think of a whole lot of places that would be messier 
I mean, I've got a daughter that has horses and cattle and chickens on her farm, and uh, her her barn, she keeps it reasonably clean and, and neat and everything, but I don't think I'd want to sleep out there. Um, that's not That would not have been my choice, and particularly having a baby in that stable would not have been pleasant. And then uh, finally, in all of this, we have to recognize that Mary gave birth to the Son of God without benefit of medical care at all. Even in those days, midwives usually attended the birth of an infant. But there is no mention in Scripture whatsoever of any midwife being there for Mary when she gives birth to the baby Jesus. All of this chaos is happening surrounding the event that the angels just said, peace on those whom his favor rests. What happened? Well, we just simply have to recognize that peace is not in our circumstances. Let's look at a couple of other things that Jesus said later in his ministry. In John chapter 14, verse 27, he basically says to us that he came to give us a different kind of peace, a peace that really doesn't require certain circumstances in order for us to experience peace. In John 14, 27, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. I want to point out three things here. First, our peace here is from God, not from circumstances. Most of the time, we think in terms of, Boy, to be peaceful, I'm going to go to my most peaceful place, the, the most tranquil experience that I can think of. And I, I do have some of those places in my mind. Uh, I, almost every August, uh, we get a chance to go out to the Rocky Mountains, and we have a relative that has a cabin out there. They let us use it. And I just love sitting out on the deck. You can't see another house in any direction You've got trees all around you, hummingbirds once in a while coming in, and you just kind of sit out there in, an e in a lounge chair, and it, it's peaceful. But that's not what God means by peace. That's tranquil, uh, it's, but it depends on circumstances. You know, if it starts to rain, my peace is ruined. Uh, last, last summer when we went, we had a bear approach the cabin, at that point, peace is out the window. <laughs> um, uh, I was in the house, and uh, Pam was actually walking down the stairs with the dog and had her do a U-turn and head back in. But, um, yeah, peace is not the same as tranquility, tranquil circumstances. Um, peace is unlike anything that the world gives. It says in this verse, I do not give you as the world gives. The world wants peace. They, they're seeking peace. But they think that somehow to get that peace, they have to manipulate everything around them. And I think this is a lot of what has caused so much conflict in, in our culture today, is that people say, you know, if you disagree with me, then I'm not going to be at peace, and so you must be hating me and, and you're disturbing my peace, my peaceful situation. So I have to be at odds with you and I have to force you to comply with exactly what I agree with. And that's kind of the attitude of a lot of our culture, is that I have to conform everything around me to, wit, to the way I want things to be. And when I've conformed everything around me to the way I want things to be, then I'll have peace. It's not going to happen, folks. Not going to happen. God gave all of us a mind and an opinion, and no two are alike, like fingerprints. So, um, it is unlike anything that the world experiences. Only God's peace can truly alleviate our fears. He closes this passage in John 14 by saying, Let not your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. It's a passage, it's a phrase that he repeats again uh, in other places in, in this uh, sermon as well. He's telling us, don't be afraid, because I can give you peace in this. 
Now, he goes even further than this in chapter 16, which, by the way, 14, 15, 16, are all part of the same sermon. And chapter 16 is kind of at the conclusion of it. He says in verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Now, I would just love to kind of end the paragraph there and leave the rest of this verse off because that's my goal. I want peace. And he says, I've told you these things so that you can have peace. All right, good. But that's not where the verse ends. Here's what the verse finishes with. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Now, there's some principles here that we need to understand, too. Jesus tells us very clearly, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus had trouble. Jesus had opposition. We're no better than he is. We're going to have troubles as well. We're going to experience pain. We're going to experience uncomfortable things. And, you know, that's part of being a human being. We're going to have trouble. And we cannot escape it. I, I feel like sometimes... And I've had, the, I've had this discussion with people on, on many different occasions through my ministry. Somebody will say to me, well, I would like to believe in God, but God allows such, you know, this evil or that evil or so-and-so got sick or somebody died that I loved and, and a loving God wouldn't do any of those things. And I tell them, you know what, the only thing God guarantees us or that Jesus guarantees us here is you will have trouble. It's a guarantee. You can count on it. But in the same verse, he's saying, I told you these things so that you may have peace. So the two are not mutually exclusive. You can have trouble and you can have peace at the same time. They go together. Now, they're not causal. It's not that trouble causes peace or peace causes trouble. No, it's that these two things are kind of running together and they do not affect each other. And that is tremendous news to know that our peace is not disturbed by troubles. We can have troubles and still have peace. It doesn't go away just because we're going through a rough time. I love the way he finishes this verse. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Take heart. He's saying here, I'm going to give you a spoiler alert here on life. And the spoiler alert is this. In the end, we win. Okay? In the end, Christ overcomes the world, and he is, he is victorious in the end. And so throughout it, we can have a great deal of peace. Peace is not about how we feel, about our re- but it is about our relationship with God. This is a critically important concept about peace. And for, to kind of lay out this, I, I start, I'm going to start in the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, verses 13 to 15, the prophet Jeremiah is prophesying at the time when God's people are soon to be taken into exile and taken away to Babylon. And uh, he's, he's trying to prepare the people, telling them, you're going to be taken away. You're going to come under God's judgment because of the evil things that you've done. And nobody's listening. And in verses 13 through 15, he says these words to the people. He says, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike all practice deceit. In other words, there's nobody honest left. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No. They have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen and they will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. 
He's talking here about really the world's concept of peace. The world's concept of peace is we don't have to change our evil behavior, all of those consequences that we're experiencing. We're just going to kind of try to minimize those consequences. Oh, it's not really that serious because we don't want to turn to God. We don't want to be repentant. But if we talk about peace enough that somehow this is going to happen, and the reality is that's not true. This story ended with them being taken into exile for 70 years imprisonment because of their failure to obey God. Just saying peace, peace doesn't bring peace. The angel's announcement in verse 14 was looking forward to, I think, God's full plan being implemented. He says in verse 14, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, if some of you memorize that in the King James Version, and you remember goodwill toward men at the end of that, well, if you actually look at the translation itself, goodwill toward men is really not the best translation of that. The best translation or the better translation is peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, what is, what's the significant difference there? Well, if you just say goodwill toward men, you could actually say, well, peace is to ex be extended to all men. Everybody gets peace. And we know that isn't true. We know it isn't true. But what he's saying here is that peace or goodwill is going to come to those on whom his favor rests. Now, who are the people on whom his favor rests? Those people are those who trust in him. And we're going to see that in, in just a moment here. Those who put their trust in Jesus will know peace. Those who do not put their trust in Jesus will not experience that peace. This is not a universal, global promise of peace. Now, yes, there will come a time of peace in the millennial kingdom, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I think he's talking about the peace that he is going to bring to those who trust in him. In the book of Romans, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, God, uh, uh, Paul talks about how God's plan all along has to been to make peace. Now, we are agitated, we're in turmoil, we're, we're, we're not comfortable with where we are, we're irritable. But there are many relationships we have that influence that. You know, you can have great relationships going on all around you, and you've got maybe one relationship that's out of sync. And what happens to your mindset at that point? You focus in on that one, and it, it destroys your peace, doesn't it? when you focus in on that relationship that's out of sync. But you know what? There is one relationship that is absolutely critical that you need to settle first in order to have peace. You cannot have peace without this relationship being in sync. And it's in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Uh, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the, the one relationship where we must be at peace is in our relationship to God. We have to come to the point where we know that we are forgiven for our sins, that we uh, have eternal salvation, eternal, eternal life. And when we come to that point, there is a peace that we have that is now able to extend to all of our other relationships. It's like... You know, you've got this great big thing that's got to be dealt with first. And once you've dealt with that, everything else is little tiny stuff. And everything else can be dealt with. That is what we're, we're, what we're looking at here. We need peace with God first. And that means trusting Christ as our Savior. I love uh, Isaiah 26.3 which goes on and, and says that once we have peace with God, 
it's the prerequisite for peace in every other area of our life. And in Isaiah 26.3, uh, Isaiah says this. He says, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. This is, this is how peace works. Once we have peace with God, my heart is settled now. I know that I am his, that he loves me, and that gives me a great deal of peace. But the relationships around me are still kind of troublesome. There are still situations, maybe at work, maybe with family, maybe with neighbors. There are other people that come into our life, and we think, those are, those are just uncomfortable, unpeaceful-like situations. But what Isaiah is saying here is if you want perfect peace, you got to get your mind steadfast, trusting in God. You go back to that first relationship. You go back to that relationship with God. If I have peace with God, everything else can be handled. And he's, I love the th fact that he says it's perfect peace, and it's part of a steadfast mind. We've got to constantly keep in our mind, I'm at peace with God. So I can also be at peace with fill in the blank. Most of you are thinking of a specific fill in the blank, aren't you? Uh, that's kind of the way it is. There are those people that maybe uh, have disrupted our peace. Now, since peace comes from God, we can have peace in every area of our life. 2 Thessalonians 3.16. Here's how uh, Paul uh, states this. He says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with, you, with all of you. Do you notice what he said here? He doesn't say, you're going to get those snatches of peace. You know, that moment or two on the deck in the Rocky Mountains, and then the rest of your life is going to be chaos. That's not what he's saying. He's saying he's going to give you peace at all times and in every way. I think that's pretty exhaustive. That's basically saying God's giving us peace all of the time in every relationship, in every set of circumstances. It doesn't matter because peace is coming from the inside. Peace is not dependent on those circumstances. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul gives us a great pattern of uh, how we can deal with worry and concern and, and that lack of peace. Because, let's face it, all of us fall into those times when there's a lack of peace in our life. We've got demands being made or there are relationships that are struggling or whatever it is, and we need peace, but we don't know how to go about it. Well, Paul tells us in Philippians 4, 6 and 7 how to do this. Verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. I think what he's saying is this. We have a tendency when things go bad, to immediately become anxious. And, and let's face it, sometimes things don't even have to go bad for us to become anxious. We just get into playing the what-if game where we start thinking of things might go bad, and if they were to go bad, oh, it would be terrible, and then we become anxious, and we start to worry, and nothing bad has happened yet. But we're just kind of anticipating it. So he's saying here, Instead of going to that default mechanism of anxiety and worry and being all tied up in knots, in every situation, not just spiritual things, not just the little things, I'm talking about big things, little things, everything, in every situation, by prayer and petition. In other words, be specific with God. If there's something that's worrying you, something that's causing you anxiety, take it to God. And with thanksgiving, now why did he throw that in there? Uh, I think God threw that in there.
because Thanksgiving reminds us that God has already done this before in our lives. There are many things that he's brought us through. Um, I, I remember a, a joke from some time ago. Uh, a guy said, well, you know, I worry a lot, but I know that my worrying works. So I asked, well, how do you know it works? Well, because 95% of the things I worry about don't happen. And, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> that, that's not an indication that worry works. Um, what it is, is it's saying God has protected me in the past. I've worried about this, I've worried about this, I've worried about that. And God brought me through all those things. And so I can be thankful for those things. I can be thankful of those situations. But we're to present a request to God. I think one of the toughest things to learn as a Christian is how to be honest with God. How to simply tell God what's on our mind and what we're thinking about. And you know something foolish about that? He already knows. He knows every thought you've thought, any fleeting thought that has gone through your mind. He knows that. So why is it so difficult to tell him what we're thinking, what we're struggling with? It's important because it means that we're coming to him and we're saying, God, I can't do this. I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to let you deal with this. Now, that's all part of verse 6. Verse 6 is the process. This is what we need to do. Verse 7 is what God's going to do. When we do what is in verse 6, we choose not to be anxious, instead to pray with thanksgiving, presenting honestly our request to God. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What's he mean here? Well, first of all, again, we see that this peace is from God. This is not worldly peace. This is, this is God's peace. And he's saying it transcends all understanding. In other words, it goes beyond anything we can understand. There is no explanation whatsoever for the peace of God. No human explanation. We can't say, well, it was because I was thinking positively, or we can't say because I did this or that. No, there is nothing that helps us to understand the peace of God. It just goes way beyond us. And he says it will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Now, why does he include both heart and mind? I think both are essential for us to have peace. Our hearts are necessary because that's the emotional center of man. And we need to guard our emotions. We need for God to protect us from the emotional situations where we're not in control of our emotions. But we also need him to protect us from our mind. A wandering mind that is not steadfast is not going to be at peace with God. And so we need to remember that uh, we are to be steadfast in trusting our relationship with God. Going back to that fact that I have peace with God so everything else is small potatoes. We need to recognize that that is our priority. I want to close this morning with a verse that I think is an, a great encouragement and I hope is an encouragement to you. In this Christmas season, there are many people who are struggling, who are going through tough times. Um, maybe it's a loss. Maybe it's a, things are different this year. Um, this year, we may have uh, some of our gatherings uh, not happen because of weather and things like that. And, and it can cause us to become aggravated, can cause us to maybe lose that sense of peace that I think God wants us to have, that the angels promised on that mountainside, on that hillside. Romans 15, 13 is, I think, a great benediction for us this morning. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Let's close in prayer. God, it is our desire to trust you. Help us, Lord, to trust that relationship that we have with you so that we can experience this joy and peace that you promise us. Help us to have hope in all situations, to not become discouraged, to not let down in our pursuit of what is right. God, give us encouragement. Give us the confidence that we should take heart because you have overcome the world. Amen. Thank you for coming. We'd like to see everyone come back tonight.